how would you set the goals for YouTube? Hey everyone, I'm here today to do another product management mock interview with Selena. We're super excited to have you back on the show to do another interview, Selena. But before we jump into it, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Nice to meet you viewers. My name is Selena. I'm a product manager at Facebook and I actually know Stephen from back during our time together at Stanford. Um, and I also previously did a mock interview with Exponent about uh, Facebook movies, which is really popular, as Stephen mentioned, so happy to be back. Yeah, um, your video just reached 100,000 views. By the time people are watching this one, it might be uh, much more than that. But we're super excited to have you back uh, today and at the request of a lot of people to talk about an execution type question. These are more analytical, metrics-driven questions that are asked by top tier tech companies. Um, and so without further ado, I'll jump into asking you the question and there'll be a couple follow on questions that we'll do to investigate the issue further. Um, and so first off, we're gonna be talking about YouTube today, um, which is the platform that we're gonna be showing this video on um, and uh, an awesome like big high growth channel right now, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so the question that I have for you, Selena, is how would you set the goals for YouTube? Yeah, absolutely. Just give me one second to collect my thoughts. Take your time. All right. <clears throat> so I think the way that I'd like to go about this is first we'll talk a little bit about YouTube, YouTube's mission, uh, and what their overarching goals would be in like a high level metric bucket that we would want to set as success. And then we'll dive into user actions that could best support that overall metric so we can hone in a little bit closer on what we'd actually like to track. And then from there, I'll propose some tactical metrics as well as a top line goal metric, and then probably some counter metrics that we wanna watch out for. And then I'll close it up with an evaluation of any trade-offs. Sounds great, thanks for laying it out. Awesome. Yeah, so YouTube's mission overall, I would say is to, first of all, entertain its users, you know, Billions of people all over the world love to go to YouTube to watch videos every day, um, but also to inform. I think a lot of people also use YouTube with that use case to educate themselves and learn something new. Um, so in terms of an overall metric, I think we could either go for, you know, an engagement bucket metric or potentially retention or monetization. Um, so YouTube monetizes with ads and they actually also have a subscription product, a couple subscription products. Um, YouTube Premium, YouTube TV. So I think we could consider a monetization as well, but I really think that it's important to focus first on engagement and then monetization will follow. So if you have users who are loving your product, who are coming back to your product and spending time in your product, that's how you're able to monetize and you know either insert ad breaks or upsell people to the subscription product. So I think I would really like to focus on an overall goal of monetization. We'll, we'll drill, I mean, sorry, of uh, engagement and we'll drill into that a little bit further as we go in. That sounds great, um, that makes sense. Before we jump into that perspective, I'm curious, Selena, if you'd have a perspective on when we wouldn't prioritize it that way. Like, would we, um, if, if, is there a case you can imagine where we might prioritize monetization over engagement? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, YouTube is a mature product, so we, we could focus on monetization at this stage. I think you just want to be careful to not focus only on monetization and forget why uh, you're building the product in the first place, which is to entertain people. I think once you have a really stable, sturdy base, like definitely you can add teams that really focus on monetizing and really growing your, your books. But I think, you know, overall engagement is the way to win. And you know, there's competitors encroaching in the space like uh, Facebook uh, videos, for example, on Facebook Watch. So I think engagement is the way to go in this particular case. Totally. Cool, yeah, go ahead with the engagement and, and we'd love to drill into that more. Okay, awesome. So I think next is um, thinking about user actions that would help to lead to engagement. So YouTube is all about watching videos. So I would say that's really the number one action that we want to drive is, you know, how many videos users are watching per day, how long they're staying to watch videos. Um, you could probably also look at the diversity of videos they're watching. Are people deep diving into one particular area or are they really, you know, exploring the full variety of content from different content producers as well? Um, so I think that's on the watch time side. And then on the other engagement activities that you can do, I know you can like, you can comment, 
you can subscribe. So I think those are all really important actions that help fuel this ecosystem because you know, YouTube, it's not just viewers, there's also creators, which is really important for the overall amount of content that's on the platform. So I would wanna make sure that there was, um, you know, engagement in terms of users uh, following them and commenting and liking. So I think those are the two buckets that I'm going to start with for now. So we have watch time, which is, you know, number of videos watched, overall, you know, length of session, And we could also look at the average per user, as well as the overall top line numbers there. And then kind of other engagement actions, which was liking, commenting, subscribing. I'm trying to think, are there other actions that I wanna highlight in terms of engagement? You know, I think you could also consider on the creator side, uploads might be a way to measure engagement. I think I do want to focus on the viewer in this particular case. So I'll probably focus more on there, but I did want to highlight that since this is a two-sided market, you'd want to think about the creator side as well. But I think the overall, you know, North Star is really about people watching on YouTube. Totally. Okay, so now that we have this like large list of metrics that we could look at, I'm going to prioritize a couple. So I'm going to pick some tactical metrics that we would want to, you know, it's more of a gut check to make sure we're on the right track. And then a top line metric, which is our overall North Star. This is the one we wanna be driving to accomplish our overall mission of um, entertaining and informing people. Um, and then I'll also suggest a tracking metric for um, things to watch out for to make sure we're not, you know, running into too many trade-offs along the way. Okay, sounds great. So I'm just gonna take one second. Go for it. Okay, so I have my three categories. I have my tracking metrics, I have my North Star metric, and I have my counter metrics. So I'll start first with tracking. So this is really what's telling me if this was early on in the launch of the product that things are going in the right direction. Um, these are early indicators, leading indicators that things are going well. So I would want to track average watch time per user. And this is letting me know for a given user who's watching, how long are they watching? I'd also want to track the average number of videos watched per session. This is giving me a good understanding of, you know, the number of, of videos that are being shown, as well as potentially some distribution across creators. Um, and then the last one is a likes, comments, shares, I'm sorry, not shares, um, subscribes per videos viewed. So I'd wanna see that's almost like a, a like through rate, um, a kind of blended metric. So I'd want to do a weight to figure out, you know, what, what particular weight of these leads to users being more likely to come back and retain a week from now and to engage more with videos. And I would wanna see a healthy score there. Got it. And um, on that last one, do you have a hypothesis on what blend or how you'd prioritize or weight some of those uh, likes, comments, and shares or subs, I think? Yeah. Yeah. I think here I would actually be inclined towards subscribers because I think that's what really powers the ecosystem that then would lead creators to want to upload more videos. So I think that would be really important, but also this is also a social product. So I would want to make sure that there's still, you know, discussion going on in the threads as well. Got it. Um, okay, so then this brings me to my North Star, which is really watch time. At the end of the day, that's how you know, you're know you gonna get your monetization down the line and how you're also going to prove that users are enjoying the content that's there. Um, and this can vary with length of videos. So there's different lengths of uh, content on YouTube, like this video will be a certain length. So I think we'd also wanna pay attention to you know how watch time is distributed as the length of content varies, right? Because maybe you'd have someone watching uh, a one hour video and bailing out and they only watched one video versus people watching a lot. And there's a lot of different um, content format links that are coming out. So I think that could help to inform the strategy moving forward. Totally. Um, that sounds like a great North Star metric. Like um, any concerns with it as we've come to this or kind of circling around this metric? 
Yeah, so I think that's a great uh, transition to my counter metrics. And one of them would be, you know, uh, wanting to make sure that people spend time, it's like time well spent. Um, I know that's the Facebook metric, but basically we don't want people spending so much time on YouTube that they forget to live. So I would wanna make sure that people are, you know, um, healthy and enjoying the internet in a positive way. Um, I think there's also a distribution concern, right? If people are just really rabbit holing on one particular length, you know, they're not expanding to the full ecosystem of, of creators. So I'd wanna make sure that, you know, all the different creators had at least some share of that distribution. Um, and then I, I guess there's other counter metrics that aren't related to watch time. Do you, do you wanna talk more about these inverse of watch time metrics or am I, should, am I good to cover the other counter metrics? Um, you can cover the other counter metrics. Okay. Yeah. So the other two that I wanted to watch out for was churn. So this is all about engagement um, and retention is not quite the same, but if I was noticing, you know, a drop off in users who weren't coming back to me, this would show me that the quality of the videos we were showing wasn't matching what they expected. So I would be looking out for that. And another one I would look out for is the amount of reported videos. So maybe watch time is up, it is really high, but these videos are um, low integrity, which is a brand risk. So you want to make sure that, you know, the content is up to a certain standard, especially there's, you know, a lot of kids that watch YouTube. So I'd want to make sure that, you know, our community uh, was a positive and safe place for all of our users to be. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Um, any other comments about the metrics and, and sort of the ones that you've, the counter metrics as well, before I ask a hypothetical question about um, the metrics? Yeah, I think you could maybe also consider the counter metric of, of um, creator distribution. You know, I kind of mentioned that as something you don't want to track long watch time, but I could see that also being a counter metric to look out for if you just saw a really high concentration on specific videos. Um, I know this is also something that uh, YouTube changed the way that videos could go viral to help ensure kind of more distribution for um, all different types of videos. So you wouldn't want too much watch time concentrating on any one particular producer or video type. So you might want to track that, not just as a North Star, but as a counter metric as well. Totally. Um, okay, awesome. Well, thanks for the thoughtful discussion around watch time. I want to transition this interview into a different sort of question where we're going to imagine that that key North Star metric that you picked of watch time um, is unfortunately suffering a three to 4% decline over the past couple of weeks. Um, and so, or, you know, weeks, two months, maybe, uh, let's approximate, but um, the time range isn't so important as insofar as what I want you to do is to imagine that you're a PM at this team um, and, you know, you've done this thoughtful consideration around watch time. Um, but how would you investigate what's going on here or what's causing this decline in that North Star metric? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the most important thing whenever this happens in an interview situation or in real life on the job as a product manager, you want to start by asking questions. You never want to immediately just run off and start diving into the data by yourself, like make sure that you're asking some key questions about this new trend. So I think the first thing I'd want to ask is how long has this been happening? Did this happen yesterday? Has this been going on for a week, maybe a month? Yeah, let's say that it's been happening for weeks to a month. So maybe like four weeks um, to a month or two ago, like we've seen this decline. So um, within the range of like two to three months or one to three months or so. Got it. So sounds like it's been going on for a while. Does that mean it's been a gradual change or was it acute like three months ago and we were just now getting around to dealing with it? Yeah, we're seeing the gradual decline to the state where it is today over the past few months. Got it. Okay, so I think my next question would be, are we seeing this decline across the board in terms of geography or is there a particular geography where we're noticing a decline? We're seeing the decline actually mostly in the domestic markets, so United States. Um, we're not seeing the decline as much in emerging markets or foreign markets. Got it. That's good to know. Okay, let me think a little bit. You know, normally I would ask, is it just this product or a broader product? But since it's YouTube, that's kind of the, the whole thing. I guess I could ask, <laughs> um, there is YouTube TV and YouTube premium. Is this focused on watch time of a particular segment? Um, that's a great question. It's not focused on a particular segment. So we're seeing this decline kind of across the board on YouTube over the past couple of months. Okay. 
All right, this is going to be my last question before I'll put into buckets my kind of issue triage identification, sure. which is, is there a particular device type that this is focused on? Great question. Um, there isn't a device type associated with this decline. So the devices seem to be uniform across iPhone, Android, um, as well as the different device types within those categories. So like um, the different iPhones or the different, uh, you know, Samsung or um, like uh, Pixel phones. Got it. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to pause my general questions and then I'll focus in three different buckets of where I think the issue could be arising. And I like to think about this as internal to my team. Um, so I should probably ask you what team I'm on. Um, and internal to the company and then external are the three general buckets I look into. So I, I know I'm a YouTube. Is there any particular team that I'm on? Um, let's say that you're on the um, general YouTube team. You're not on premium or YouTube TV. You're on the YouTube product that people generally see when they come to youtube.com as a non-paying user. Got it. Okay. So given what I'm hearing that this happened gradually from weeks to months, focused in the US and it's happening across the board, this would lead me to think it was either due to something that happened externally, potentially with a competitor, or that's something that happened internally that has happened over time. Um, that's either due to an experiment or a deprioritization. But since it's gradual, this is telling me that it's a user behavior shift normally more than it would be um, an infrastructure issue or a system that went down, um, which would typically demonstrate a more um, acute sudden decline. So uh, I'll run through a couple questions. I think first I'll ask the, the burning question, which is, you know, uh, did our competitors launch something when, within that three month period that's drawing um, share away from our products? Because that's kind of what I'm feeling is maybe most at play. Yeah, so um, definitely we've seen a lot of competitive products in this space in the past couple of months. Um, and so there is tough competition, and we do know that from just like a marketing or partnerships perspective, but it's a little unclear to us right now if that's the reason that we're experiencing the decline, but that definitely could be something we want to investigate further. Okay. Got it. Um, all right, let me think. Um, maybe I'm also thinking externally. I know we work with uh, partners and third parties, so is there anything that happened potentially with a partner or someone that we work with that would have gradually caused this decline. Maybe they were migrating off of, um, like I know we offer YouTube on TVs, maybe some older TVs no longer support our YouTube app or, or something like that that could be causing the issue. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, a lot of, for example, um, Android devices might partner with certain OEMs to make sure certain apps appear there. And there could be a case where the YouTube app did not appear on a device partner. Uh, but in this case, um, we're not seeing any changes in partnerships. In fact, the partnership season, let's just say, is in two months. So the renewals of all those contracts would have happened then, and it wouldn't have happened within the past few months. Got it. Um, let's see. So I guess this is my last external question before I go into internal to the company problems. Was there any bad press that happened about our company um, maybe a couple months ago that would cause users to slowly but surely abandon? <laughs> uh, it's a great question again. I mean, uh, Sundar Pichai himself has been testifying in front of the US government. Um, so there could be something there, but for now, for all intents and purposes, we're not seeing something so damaging or so shocking that would have caused a huge change in the metrics. Got it, okay. So now I'll ask some questions that probably are arising from uh, internal to the company issues. Um, but I'm still holding on to that. It could have been something with the competition in the back. Cool. So my second leading theory, uh, second from uh, competition would actually be cannibalization. So did we launch something new that's separate from watch time um, that would maybe be drawing users slowly away um, or maybe something we're experimenting with that's being rolled out gradually that could be impeding watch time? Yes, so we've actually launched um, a feature on YouTube where you can see it's kind of sort of like Instagram Reels or TikTok, um, where we've created a lot of like short clips of videos that users can browse through really quickly. YouTube Shorts, yes, very. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I would say that 
that would be likely since it's shorter length content to lead to a decrease in watch time. Three to 4% seems pretty consistent where I wouldn't expect it to be an enormous sea change, but as users are adopting this product more and more, um, if that length of videos is shorter than the typical YouTube video length, then you would see a corresponding drop in watch time. Um, Got it. So, like Go that's ahead. not necessarily a bad thing, you know, um, given all of the uh, engagement, especially among younger audiences with TikTok, this could be a strategic choice. Um, and it is a strategic choice to, to launch this product. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a cause for alarm in the near term, but we should definitely be thinking about, you know, how much watch time are we willing to give up um, to support this new product launch? And, you know, maybe, maybe watch time isn't the right North Star. Maybe it's, you know, how much enjoyment users are getting out of the videos. And since there's a general trend towards shorter videos, maybe, you know, a total max watch time isn't necessarily the best demonstrator of people enjoying this new product. Totally. Um, and yeah, like, you know, in this particular case that we're talking about today, um, we can imagine that YouTube Shorts was just launched. Um, and so in that case, the algorithm wasn't quite right maybe let's say to ensure long-term engagement or longer term watch time. Um, and so that might've cannibalized some of the YouTube traffic that we normally expect with users watching short form content that is not as effective at finding the algorithm to get users to continue to watch the experience, um, which could definitely happen when a company launches a new product, but hopefully in the future cases, YouTube wouldn't see that decline um, as much. Yeah, absolutely. I think since algorithms learn from user behavior, it's almost expected in the near term, if you're moving away from a longer content form to a shorter content form, that it's not going to immediately get it right. Totally. Um, so congrats on getting the right answer. I know it's stressful and I thought you did a great job kind of discussing a lot of the different criteria. Um, I'm curious also for you, if you were going to just dig any further, is there anything else you would have explored um, had you had the opportunity to, to explore some of the other avenues or answers? Yeah, so um, I think a similar side of the coin, I would ask, you know, are we deprioritizing our regular product in favor of another one, which is kind of the exact same question, but focusing instead on on the relative prioritization of the two products, which I think is absolutely true. Um, I, sometimes I look at internal to the team, which I think with a product like YouTube maybe is a little less valid, but sometimes you can think, okay, did my particular team launch an experiment that's impacting another team or vice versa? Um, I think here it's easier to think about it as a total platform effect because of um, the way YouTube is as a product. So that's always an area I like to explore as well. Totally. Um, well, Selena, you can take off the interviewee hat. You did an awesome job. I want to debrief. <laughs> yeah, I want to debrief um, like how this was for you. And um, I wrote down some thoughts on what I thought you did so awesome with this interview. And I thought it was a really rich uh, conversation that's really educative also. So I'm really grateful you were able to do this. But before I jump into my thoughts, did you have any self-reflection or um, self-feedback on how that went for you? Yeah, I think overall it went really well. I mean, full disclosure, I did intern at YouTube uh, about a year and a half ago now, it feels like forever. Um, so I did have a little bit of familiarity with, with the company. Um, and yeah, I think the, the one area that I felt like I could have done a little bit better was defending why not to go for monetization. Um, you know, I think it, it's always a little bit of a snake chasing its own tail between uh, engagement and monetization, but you can't run a company without having money at the end of the day. So I think that's something that's important to understand when is the right time to focus on that. And I think that's something a lot of companies struggle with. Um, but otherwise, I thought that that part was good. I think maybe you were looking for a different trade off that I didn't mention during the, the metric identification. So I guess I'll, I'll listen to you on that front. Um, and then uh, in the second half around the issue identification, I think there's two kind of flavors for this. Sometimes interviewers are looking for you to identify um, the case and sometimes they just wanna hear how you would talk through that. So I, I've experienced both in my, my interviewing experience. And I think you know either way you wanna just be reasoned with your thinking. And if you don't always get to the right answer, even if that's what they were looking for and you talk through it in a structured way, I think you can still do well. Totally, that's awesome advice. Um, yeah, let me run through. I mean, I agree with what you said. I, I, some things that I thought you did really, really effectively, Selena, were one, you, you did such a great job checking in with me 
I felt like I was always on the same page with you throughout that interview. Um, and you know, you, you even did stuff where you would say like, you know, I'm gonna move on to this section and you really communicated with me frequently throughout the interview, especially with execution questions. It gets really easy to kind of slip into this pattern where you're gonna say, hey, like, is it this? Is it that? Is it this? And then um, I, as an interviewer, don't really have a sense of what you're thinking or how you're thinking about that problem. And so that's not an effective tool you know, for the interviewer to assess your capabilities. But um, one line in particular that stood out to me was, you know, you said, I'm going to keep competition in the back of my head or over here, um, and you know, I'm going to move on to this section. And I thought that was really effective because you, you sort of acknowledge the interviewer, you know, I haven't fully figured that out, um, and I know it's still an open issue, but I'm going to investigate these other things. And I thought that communication style was really, really valuable. Um, I also thought you did a great job of breaking down the problem. So you'd often enumerate or um, split up the problem space into different components. For example, internal, external to the company, external, or sorry, internal to the team, internal to the company, or external. That was a really awesome way to break down the problem and to know where your head was throughout each of those steps. So I thought that was really effective as well. And you did that a couple times. Um, I think, you know, I, I may have jumped uh, ahead of you on this one, but mentioning countermetrics beforehand or, you know, making sure you slip those in is really important. Um, I actually didn't have a specific uh, countermetric that I was looking for. So it's funny that you thought that maybe I was just putting on my tough interviewer face or something. But um, it was more, more honestly, like a, the countermetric discussion that I think you did was a really thoughtful one. And um, if I had more time, I would have asked you more about, you know, like time well spent. What does that look like in that experience? Um, I do agree the monetization angle, we could have had maybe a richer conversation around that, uh, but I didn't think that that was so um, important to the essential interview question that I was asking. It was kind of a side tangent that I took you along. Um, so honestly, overall, I, I, and the last thing that I wanted to mention is that you really did a great job of thinking about the goals of the company first. These questions often seem tricky, but they um, really make a lot of sense when you think about the goals. And so I loved that you thought about the goals first and then kind of boiled it down. So um, I don't have too much constructive feedback. I thought this was like a really awesome answer. It was a really fun conversation also. Um, and then, yeah, maybe maybe one last point that I would say is just that the execution part at the end, um, you know, being specific about how you'd identify those issues. So, you know, you asked if they're competitors, um, but there might be more specific ways to identify competitive com competitive uh, companies in the space. Um, so perhaps you could have asked about like, um, you know, are there other analogous products within Google's ecosystem or partner network that have seen a decline or maybe are users of YouTube's API um, seeing a decline or, you know, embedded videos on YouTube seeing a decline that might start to hint at if it's a competitive issue or not. So um, that was just one uh, constructive piece of feedback, but overall, really awesome interview. Um, do you have any thoughts, reactions, comments, or, or last tips for the viewers? No, I think that all sounds great. And I think that's a really awesome suggestion to, you know, think about other other ways to plug into, is this an internal or external issue outside of the, the core product? So I think APIs um, is a great suggestion if that's the type of product you're focusing around to um, get at that same question from a different angle. Um, thanks again, Selena, for being on the show. Thanks, it was really great to see you. And for those of you watching, good luck on your upcoming interview. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.